Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Amanda. I'm and Allison. Oh. Thank you, Allison. I, yes, it's this is how this is going to go so uh thank you everyone for joining us again um of course we're still staying at home uh, where we are safe and we are healthy um we hope you all are as well so we're back again and our topic today is one of my favorites um it was brought to you uh by mrs prather at Fraser Elementary. Uh, so we want to give a thank you to her. We would have been reaching out to her students um, next week. Mm -hmm. Whatever date we're at right now, we would have been talking to her uh, and talking to her students doing our fantasy animal project. I and love this project. I love this one. It's a guilty pleasure. Um, and it, it's talking about habitats and adaptations. Um, so this is a topic that is for all grades, all ages, uh, and we invite everybody to participate in this. Um, it's pretty fun. So yeah. uh, when we talk about habitats and adaptations, these big words, habitats, of course, are our different type of, types of ecosystems all over the world that different animals and plants live in. Um, of course, we know our native habitats here the best. We have our forests, we have our grasslands, uh, we have our streams and creeks and lakes and wetlands. We have our edge habitats where all those different habitats meet one another. Um, and understanding what those habitats are is really important. But then if we flip over and we look at our animals and understand their different traits, those things that help them to survive, every single thing about their body, every behavior that they have, those instincts, all help our animals to survive in those habitats. Um, so it's kind of like a matching game. Yeah. There's a catch. So all those body parts, all those behaviors about all of our animals here in Ohio and all over the world, they do help them to survive. But the catch is they really only help them to survive and thrive if they're in their habitats most of the time. But um, it's important that we understand that because habitat equals animal. If we want to have that animal on this planet, then we need to provide their habitat because their habitat is what provides their basic needs. Food, water, shelter, air, and space. Now, probably our best animal to highlight this, um, and if you've been in one of my programs before, I love taking my catfish puppet out, but I don't have my catfish puppet here. So we're gonna switch over here. We're going to use the um, Ohio Department of Natural Resources, Division of Wildlife. Uh, we're using their pages again here. We're going to keep referencing this and I will put a link in the comments um, so that you can find this on your own as well. So we're gonna look at our channel catfish today. Um, you can see the channel catfish, it can be found here in Ohio. Um, it's a popular sport, uh, fish for sport and food. Um, now, Allison, if we wanted to see a catfish today, what mm -hmm. habitat would we go to? Oh, we definitely need water. So we would <laughs> want to go to a lake to find our catfish. Absolutely. This is a fairly sizable fish. Um, I worked with a catfish once. It was an albino catfish, so she was bright pink. Um, she would let you pet her on the head. She was one of my oh. favorites. Um, <laughs> But yeah, we would go to a lake to see a catfish. So let's say we do that. Let's say that we head out to something like Sippo Lake. So when we look at Sippo Lake Park and we look at what this lake would look like. So we have a lake that, this lake is about 109 acres. Um, we can see we have aquatic plants growing around the lake. We have this edge habitat of forests and wetlands meeting the edge of this lake. But this lake is definitely big mm -hmm. enough to have some channel catfish in there. Mm -hmm. So let's say it's, a, it's a, a regular day where we could go out fishing. We catch a catfish um, and 
you know, that would mean we'd have to be pretty lucky. I usually don't catch anything. I usually just eat snacks and maybe read a book. Um, <laughs> That's my fishing style too. And, yeah. Yeah. So let's say we catch a catfish. We get to see this catfish. We look at all these amazing body parts, their behaviors, their instincts. I learned on vacation last summer in Wisconsin that catfish make noise. It's not a meow. Whoa. Um, but yes, they make noise. And, you know, doing the flopping to get back in the water, making the noise, seeing these whiskers, seeing the gills, um, their smooth bodies, these fins, everything that helps them to survive and get food, water, shelter, and air in their habitat, which is under the water in the lake. Now, we're not allowed to keep a wild animal as a pet. We know mm -hmm. this. Um, I don't know how to cook a catfish. Allison, do you? I do not. I, I don't either. I've had it. It's good. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know how to, I don't know how to cook this. So we're going to put our catfish back. But this catfish uh, that we put back in the lake, he has no idea there's this great big world out here. There's a wetland, there's a forest, um, all these great neighborhoods around here. Um, let's put him back in the forest. He can see something else. What's going to happen to our catfish if we put him back in the forest? Oh, I don't think that's a very good idea. I don't think he'll be able to survive if we take him out of the water and we put him in the forest. Right. So there's our catch. So what's going to happen first to our catfish? What body part is automatically not going to be as effective? Oh, that'd be his gills. His yeah. gills won't work very well. No. So gills work great for us. They work perfectly great in my living room um, or if I'm out walking around on land. Um, but I can't survive under the water because I have lungs. Just like the mm -hmm. catfish with the gills, he can't survive up here on land. So as much as we want to share the forest experience with him, that's not going to be a pleasant experience for a catfish. Right. He's not going to survive successfully mm -hmm. in the forest. He would not like the forest. He would not like the forest. He would not appreciate our effort. So that's our catch. Animals have these body parts, these traits that help them to survive. Um, but they have to match to their habitat. We tend to think of animals as being like superheroes. And you can't blame us. There's a lot of superheroes based on things that animals can do. Mm -hmm. um, Spider-Man. We yeah. have Wolverine. Um, I don't know if that man fits in there. Probably sparking a huge debate. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> we base these things. We call them superhuman. So yes, animals can do different things things than us, but they can only do the things that their bodies allow them to do, just like us. And those bodies have adapted to get food, water, shelter, and space in their habitats. So if their habitats change, those animals may or may not survive. Um, and then the species overall, if that habitat change is drastic enough. So when we do our fantasy animal project, that's really what we're learning about. Now, you know, if we take a look at three native Ohio animals, if we take a look at something like a box turtle. So this is Bowie. This is who we would typically get to see during this program. Bowie is an Eastern box turtle. They are native to the United States. And when we see turtle, we typically think of um, the water. But this species mm -hmm. does not live in the water. If we look closer at these body parts, we have clubby feet like an elephant. We have more of a hamburger bun shaped shell so we can really fit inside. Um, and we have a, a shorter little tail here. So let's take a look so you can see what this animal looks like and how it's using these body parts to move through its habitat. The deciduous forest of the Midwest is home to many plants and animals we all recognize. One such animal, the eastern box turtle, is lurking throughout the forest floor. This turtle is a male eastern box turtle. You can identify it by his bright red eyes. The female eastern box turtle has dark eyes. <clears throat> this is the only known turtle species to have different colored eyes according to gender. The 
Eastern box turtles got their name because they inhabit the eastern part of the United States. Some live as far south as Florida, while others are as far west as Missouri. Eastern box turtles live in an area no larger than a square mile and aren't very territorial. They only live on land, which makes them terrestrial, unlike their aquatic cousins. The only time you may see a box turtle in water is when they want to cool off. Eastern box turtles love to visit creeks because they not only provide water, but contain many food sources. In terms of diet. So we can see these little tanks plodding their way through the forest. It makes sense, but all those body parts are working together. And looking into those a little bit further on something like the Division of Wildlife's website, um, we'll really dig in further of how they're surviving, how they get food, water, and shelter. It's a little bit different than us. So those body parts are so specific to that box turtle. If we take a look at another native species, our big brown bat. So um, this is, this one, yeah, this is, this is Echo, I believe. Mm -hmm. So this is Echo, our big brown bat. Uh, Echo typically comes out for these programs. What a specific animal with th these abilities that, that not a lot of things have. It's our only flying mammal, of course. Mm -hmm. This little fur-covered body that's about the size of our thumb, eating thousands and thousands of insects a night, just one. So these little bats are such a keystone species, but all these body parts that have to come together to have the abilities that these bats have. Echolocation, um, they can see, they can hear, what they can carry, how they catch these insects is very different from most other animals on mm -hmm. earth. Um, so let's take a look at how these body parts come together for this animal to get food. This is one of my favorites. Fountains Abbey in Yorkshire is a good place to watch hunting bats in action, including one of the most common. Dorbinson's bat, also known as the water bat. Old stone bridges are a favorite roost. Water bat chirps aren't exactly subtle. At 110 decibels, it makes more bang. Like us, most of the insects it hunts can't hear ultrasound. As the bat homes in, its squeaks speed up. So all those abilities, those behaviors, and all those body parts working together, it's so much more complicated. Just getting a video like that is amazing. Being able to watch it and observe, mm -hmm. you know, that's how we learn these things over time about these animals. Um, a screech owl, another animal that we have in this area, the eastern screech owl. Again, amazing abilities that we can't even fathom, being able to see that well, hear that well. Um, flying so silently the way that they do mm -hmm. and how they drop in on their prey. You know, these guys are really masters of camouflage. Um, we would have been seeing, uh, this is little Rufus. So of course this is out during the day, but this is when they would be camouflaging is during the day. This is when they're sleeping. So they don't want anyone to mess with them during the day while they're sleeping. So they really need to have great camouflage. Um, you can see these colors are just brilliant. He is the Rufus red color phase for a screech owl. So that's why his name is Rufus. If we take a peek at them actually doing what they do, they're, they're pros. Take a peek. So this little guy, someone found hanging out in the forest. 
I'll let your eyes focus in there <laughs> so you can see he's right in the center of the screen. Uh, they are cavity nesters, meaning they live in the hole in a tree. Um, they don't make the hole, they take the hole either from something else like a woodpecker or a squirrel or maybe where a branch has fallen off. But that little screech owl, this is the gray phase, um, is blending in with that bark seamlessly. They can suck in those feathers and make themselves super tiny. They can poof them out to fill that hole. There you can really see the eyes blinking. <laughs> those feather tufts on the top help um, to camouflage them even more so that you don't see that circle shape of the head. Uh, it really breaks that up. So again, we have talons. We have this amazing ability to see and hear. Their eyes are shaped differently than ours. Their ears are different than ours. Um, very, very specific in how they use those things um, to hunt and survive. Mm -hmm. So just looking, those are so different from each other and all three can be found in the forest. So, oops, oops, you know what's that? <laughs> okay, so um, keeping in mind, you know, what these animals are capable of, um, we go back to those body parts. They all find their different spot that allows them to get food, water, shelter, and air. Mm -hmm. All three of those are in the forest. So um, with our fantasy animal project, Here's what we're going to do. You can do this on your own, or you can do this with a partner or with a partner group. But what we can do is create a fantasy animal. So if you go to the Division of Wildlife, look up those species. And again, I'll put that link in uh, the comments. Create a fantasy animal. Pick and choose from Native Ohio animals and come up with an animal that doesn't exist. It might have the head of a deer and the body of an eastern cottontail rabbit, uh, the legs of an eastern box turtle. I don't know. Okay, mm -hmm. we want to think about things. Are they all warm blooded? Are they all cold blooded? If you put wings, are they big enough to have that animal fly? Will the animal weigh too much? Uh, we want to think about all those things when they're putting them together, or you can just do whatever you want. Um, put that animal together. Draw that animal on paper using whatever you'd like. Then you switch your animal with someone else's animal. And if you're on your own, you can do this on your own as well. Then with your partner's animal, draw a corresponding habitat in which that fantasy animal will be able to get food, water, and shelter and air with the body parts it has. This could be a little challenging sometimes. Yeah. Um, shout out to my Jackson local fourth graders. They just completed this project with me. They put an enormous amount of work into that. Um, I can actually show you some of their amazing artwork here. So we have fantasy animals. Uh, a lot of them chose to draw their animal and then the other group and students drew their habitat right around that animal. Some put notes on there to describe what they had. Mm -hmm. Like I said, these were pretty um, detailed animals that you can see there. We have a mm -hmm. bog forest, we have a, a Liza fox in that one. So I was so impressed with what they came up with. This is such a fun project to really stretch your brain and understand those body parts, they give them abilities to survive, but they also have limitations. They can't just do anything. So when you get done with your drawing, uh, you can take a picture of it upload that picture into the comments on Facebook. And what we need you to do is tell us what your animal is. Maybe it has a name. Tell us who created the animal if you would like, but that's not necessary. Um, and then list what body parts your animal has. So if it has fox ears, list that. Fox ears, deer legs, fish fins, so we know what we're seeing. And then you can put what you provided in that habitat for food, water, and shelter. Um, and then what hopefully we will do if we get some submissions is Alice and I will do another video and we will take a look and we'll evaluate if we think that animal would actually survive. So yeah, that's our favorite part. That's our guilty pleasure, mm -hmm. seeing your fantasy animals and seeing if they would actually survive. 
So again, we will put all those instructions and the link in the comments under this video. If you have questions as you're trying to do it, please let us know. Again, this is open to absolutely anybody, okay? And teachers, again, if you want to use this for your classes, that's fine. Uh, you can do that as well. Anything that you send us, we will absolutely evaluate. So thank you everyone for joining us again today uh, for our Fantasy Animal Project Program, part one. Yeah, I can't wait to see what they do. I know, this is my favorite part. Thank you so much for joining me today. I can't mm -hmm. wait to get to look at these. Thank you everyone. Stay safe, stay home, stay healthy, and we will see you soon. Bye. Bye, thank you.